What is up, guys? It's your boy, Derek, from Rocky Mountain Reptiles. And in front of me, I have isopods. I have five different types of isopods. Um, I actually do have seven in total between all my variants that I'll eventually be pulling out and um, full-on culturing. Uh, two of them can hybridize. The rest of them are completely different species. And I also have some spring tails that we'll be talking about. So just to get into this, um, this is going to be a little bit lengthier of a video. I cover, I'm covering a ton of information that I've learned, um, and all this information really came from my homie Jake at Nature Cube. I'll put his information on the screen. He's the one who built these beautiful variants behind me. The other ones he didn't build, build were Zoe's and Smaug's. The rest of them were completely done by him, and he's a beast. Um, and I also learned a lot of stuff from Serpent Design on YouTube as well, so I'll put both their links and information down below. Um, I'll try to do like a little time skip snippet of where everything is for those who are just seeking specific information on isopods. Um, but generally how this video is going to break down is we're going to go over um, different species. We're going to go over sizes, hybridization, um, and then we're going to go over why they're important to your care, um, their care and setup, um, what they eat, what they do in your vivarium, and just overall why you should house them and why they are kind of cool. Um, and then we're going to be talking about springtails last. Um, and then I'll pretty much try to just cover everything. Um, if you do hear anything in the background, my fiance, she is on uh, FaceTime talking to her uh, mom and dad. So don't mind that. Just bear with me. Um, it echoes a little bit in our apartment. We don't have too much furniture in here and it's vinyl floor. So, so yeah, so we're going to go ahead and start off with the hybridization or hybridized or whatever you want to call it. Um, the hybrid species, um, the two different that create one. Uh, so we're gonna go with, uh, we're gonna start with the dwarf orange and then we're gonna uh, talk about the dairy cow. Um, let me put the, pull a dairy cow out first because these are the bigger of the species. Um, and size does matter with isopods in a matter of if they'll culture in your vivarium, if your reptile will eat them, um, if they're big enough to break down the poop. Lots of different factors for, their, for the different, um, for what you're looking for. So I've actually got one right here. I'm gonna go ahead and Cool out a little munchkin. Oh, you don't want to come out. So no, so no, I don't want to come out. <laughs> come here, come here, cutie. Come here. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see this. I'm gonna hold him down just a bit. So he's showing himself really good for the camera right now. This is a dairy cow. So these guys are actually known as uh, Dalmatian isopods. Um, and this is generally the size that these guys will get. Um, and they, I think they're just absolutely adorable. They have these two little tiny, tiny eyeballs. And they are just the cutest little things. Um, Chelsea and I call them uh, pets for our pets. Because <laughs> um, they're like little pets or leopard geckos and stuff like that. And our gar gargoyles. Um, so... I just love these guys. There's nothing in special about really any of the different species in the sense of like what they do. Um, they're just cool. Like they look cool. They're different morphs. It's kind of like getting into um, different insects and things like that. So this is a dairy cow, um, also known as Dalma the Dalmatian isopods. And then what I'm going to show you next is the dwarf orange. And don't worry guys, I have honestly cross touched everything. Um, I wash my hands thoroughly, but all of the ABG mixtures and isopods have germs, same germs, so don't be hating on me in the comments. Um, these are my dwarf oranges, and these guys are super duper 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 cool. And what I am getting super excited for is that the dairy cows and the dwarf oranges, which I have in Smaug's tank, which I'll be checking on every so often, um can hybrid and make orange dairy cows, which are just, I mean, that is just, if not the coolest type of isopod, a little orange dairy cow. Come here, little man. Oh, 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 oh. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Come on. You're gonna be famous. Yeah. He's like, no, I don't wanna be famous. So, this is a tiny little orange isopod. Um... So this is a dwarf orange isopod. This is about as big as they get. You can see they're uh, 
a little bit smaller than the, the dairy cows. Um, but all in all, they're still good enough size. So if you have a relatively medium size, like leopard gecko or a, ooh, 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 come here munchkin. He just hopped off my hand. Um, if you have a leopard gecko, gargoyle gecko, um, any of the moss tail geckos, lychees, basically really anything except for like smaller um, reptiles or amphibians, you'd want to go with these guys because uh, a they're not they're they're just small enough to where your gecko's probably not gonna um, eat them, um, and obviously if you let them culture enough, uh, you shouldn't have any problems if your gecko does snag one or two. But really cool because you guys can see these guys get orange, and some of them get really 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 orange but they'll create an orange um, Dalmatian. So I think that's super rad. So that's the two that are kind of like, oh, sorry, my guy. Um, that's the two that are kind of like prize possession isopods. So those are my two um, that I kind of am culturing um, to have some fun with. So if you're getting into isopods and you kind of, why would any of this matter? Uh, when they peek out of the little vivarium, it's actually really cute. And the orange ones actually peek out quite a bit because they're orange little specks amongst the green and everything. So they're absolutely adorable. And orange with black little spots is just cute. I, I don't care. I love black and white. I have a Dalmatian. I'm just a huge graphic person. I love super Dalmatian cresties. So if I can make anything Dalmatian, I'm going to do it. Um, it has basic care, though. You get, get one of these little Sterilite bins from Walmart or I'm not Walmart, dollar, dollar store for a dollar, or, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, Jesus, I hate when that happens, get one of these bins for a dollar at the dollar store, um, or grab some old Tupperware, or go pick up a pack of Tupperware on Amazon, or Walmart, or whatever, um, the next we're gonna speak about, the next species, is the arm of the Lydian, um, and these are, like, the most notorious, these are, like, your general roly polies for North America, um, and, and a lot of the world they're found in, but there's different localities, of course, um, this is the North American locality. Um, let me find one real quick. Oh. Is that a little bean? No, it's a little shedding. All right, sorry guys. I just uh, recently threw a whole bunch of these inside of a culture. Um, oh, here we go. So let me see if I can get him off the charcoal. I'll just get him on my finger. Oh! Damn, where did you go? Oh, there you are. There we go. Okay, so these guys are the Armadillidian. And this is not their full size. This is a juvenile. And they will get about a little bit bigger than the dairy cow that I showed you. Um, these guys are generally what you find outside. The roly polies that you find, um, that you were finding as a kid, this is, this is the roly poly that you were picking up and playing with. Um, these guys are pretty much the overall one that people choose for a ton of avariums, whether it's frogs, whether it's geckos, snakes. Um, if you're doing anything bioactive, um, a lot of people go with armadillidian. Um, there are tropical subspecies that can also handle um, some more temperate and dry um, conditions. But for those wondering, oh, well, I have a desert animal like a bearded dragon or something. Yes, you can have bioactive. Um, you're just going to go, your ABG is just going to be where your plants are planted. Um, and you're going to choose when you do uh, your mixture, you're just going to add a little bit more um, sand to your mixture of the heavy uh, you can come out. I've already told them that if they hear noise in the background, it's just you. Um, you just add a little bit more sand or um, uh, and sphagnum to your mix just to make it a little bit more airy for your air plants, like your succulents and things like that. So it's just a, all about mixture. And, and uh, I basically just give a spritz um, one time a day for those types of vivariums uh, or terrariums, the desert ones. Um, the leopard geckos pretty much only get sprayed once a day. The tropical bot botanicals that I actually have inside of it will get sprayed separately, and those will get doused. Um, oh, come here, little one. But yes, so these are. This is the armadillidian, um, and this is generally the one that I, I, I populate my vivariums. This is the one that I've ha I'm having culture in zoes, as well as I have some. Um, I can't show you because I just put all of them in there, but they are these little tiny, they're called uh, uh, dwarf seas or 
I forget. Loan, I, I have to look up. I'd have to grab the thing. But yeah, super, super, super cool. Um, so that is another type of isopod. Now, these guys, I'm not 100% familiar with isopods yet. I don't know if they have like a one that they can hybrid, you know, make hybrid babies with. But all, for, for all I understand, these guys pretty much only stick with each other. Um, and for those wondering up until this point, can you mix... Yes, you can mix. Just understand that um, in a small vivarium, if you're mixing armadillidians with like dwarf oranges, the armadillidians are kind of probably out compete the dwarf oranges for food. So you want to stay with relatively the same size of isopods or completely different sizes. So um, giant canyons or armadillidians with super tiny um, dwarf, uh, even smaller than the dwarf oranges. There's uh, you know true dwarf whites and things like that that are just absolutely small, which I'll show you um, here in a second. Um, I just told you Giant Canyon, so I'll go ahead and show you Giant Canyon. These guys are pretty big, and they do get bigger than, they get a little bit bigger than this. Not too much bigger, but um, they will get bigger. There's one. Come here, Munchkin. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Sorry guys, it's a little hard to grab these sometime. Yeah, come here, come here, come here. All right, we did it together. So they kind of look like a bigger armadillidian. Um, but they do get these kind of cool patterns on them. And uh, they are, they. this is a juvie. So this will get probably, oh, oh. It'll get about double in size. Hold on, it's, it's trying to escape. It's trying to escape on me. One second, guys. He's being a little, little rascal. Oh, oh, nope, 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 nope. Don't go down there. Don't go down there. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. That's right. Got him. All right, my little escapee I got. So, like I was saying, these guys, he'll get about double size. Um, so, they get pretty big. And I would recommend these to anyone who's doing bearded dragons, tegus, um, uh, your black-throated monitors, your savannah monitors, your aki monitors, basically any large reptile, your lichionis geckos, um, chameleons, um, bigger geckos and bigger reptiles. Um, or amphibians, your Pac-Man frogs and things like that, will probably enjoy these a lot more. A, if they snag one, it's gonna be a little more protein for them. Um, and B, these are gonna knock down the poop that they uh, have, especially if you have like big snakes or something like that, you wanna do a bioactive setup for them. Um, I would recommend Giant Canyon or any of the giant species because you're gonna want um, that. And, uh, but, but yeah, these guys are super, super cool. If he was being super still, I'd try to show you the little brown, uh, they get these, uh, almost like brown and white patternation on their side scales, which you, you really, once you see them in person, you'll understand how cool they, they really are. Um, but I'll put this little dude back and let him go back in there and be happy. Oh, he doesn't want to leave my finger now. No, you don't want to go off my finger. There you go, there you go. Um, and pretty much how I have these guys set up is they just either have tiny little holes on the side of their containers or they have four small holes on the top of their, their containers. They don't need a ton of ventilation. I just have um, airflow form. Um, so last but not least, we're gonna talk about the true dwarf whites. And these guys are pretty much good for leopard geckos and like any type of small dart frogs or any culture that you don't want them to eat your isopods or it's a smaller tank um, and the maybe the poop's not as heavy um, the, the dead the dead batter that you're trying to um, eat have them eat isn't as heavy so I will try my best to pull one out but I think I might have to take the camera over to this because these guys are remarkably tiny okay so this is called a true dwarf white. Okay, I know there's one in there. Oh, there's several in here. Oh my God, there's multiple in here and I just barely... Okay guys, I'm gonna have to take the camera over here because I do not want the dwarf whites to escape. So those are the dwarf whites, that's their full size. So these would be good for um, 
dart frogs and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, you can see there's 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 one right under, there's one in there as well. There's one right there. But yeah, super 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 tiny. So I go ahead and put those back. Boop. Make sure I don't have any on my hands. You can see, that's that's one. There's one over there. I mean, they're just ridiculously small, but yeah, these are true dwarf whites, um, and I'm culturing these heavily because I really want a ton of these. Um, there's one right there. Um, they're really, really good for dart frogs, and behind me, I have a 75-gallon enclosure that I'll be using for dart frogs eventually, and I want a ton of these. Um, and last but not least, we'll go ahead and go over springtails. Um, so springtails, you don't need to poke any holes. Um, this is going to be lumpwood charcoal. And again, I got to bring the uh, thing over here. Let me see if they're jumping right now. No, they're not jumping good. Um, so they are called springtails because they do spring themselves. If you see that little tiny white speck right there that's moving, that's a springtail. Now, these guys are also, uh, they're, they're considered a microfauna. And what that means is they, they are just a, a microorganism that um, breaks down the decaying organic matter. Um, whether it be poop, plant matter, leaf litter, your sphagnum moss, whatever it is. Another springtail, an isopod, um, whatever it is, they will help break it down. These are essential with isopods for any bioactive vivarium because what the isopods miss, these will kill and eat and make better. Um, together why it's important for uh, variums for bioactive to have these is because when you're using an abg mixture the abg mixture just by itself after so many months will create ammonia and things like that within the, the lower layers of the substrate if you don't have some sort of isopods or microfauna breaking down um, the dead matters and stuff that release those toxic um, those uh, uh, um, fumes or whatever you want to call them um, so the isopods and the microfauna actually take care of that and the ammonias and nitrates and everything that are bad and they put good um, nutrients back into your soil so that all your plants pretty much get fed. Um, so once you make a... a yeah, they're, they're microfauna. Springtails are microfauna. Microfauna just re represents microfauna, mycorrhizae, springtails, pretty much anything. Yeah, it's pretty much anything under the microfauna category. Um, and if I'm wrong on that, guys, comment down below. But from every video I've watched, that's from that's what my understanding is. Is that's what they're called. Uh, so for your vivariums, you're gonna need uh, a drainage layer, which you can't kind of see because I got a little bit of cocoa. But you'll need a drainage layer, which is this hydrotin. Um, you can use there's a, lots of different types of drainage layers, but I use hydrotin. You get I use the Josh's Frog substrate, or you can just get the mosquito lining, you know, the mesh lining stuff. I'll put it on the screen. Um, and then you have your ABG mix and everyone says like three inches and stuff. I usually do like as long as you have an inch to two and a half inches spread throughout the whole thing and you have deep pockets for them. I don't ever see my isopods. They're really, really golden. I mean, all of mine down here only have like an inch and a half, two inches and they're, you never really see the isopods too much, uh, which is what you want. You want them hiding. You don't want them feeling like they have to be running around. So just make sure if you're gonna do bioactive, um, you get springtails, you get a isopod that is exactly what you need for your reptile, um, and pretty much any of the medium, uh, the normal size ones and small ones can be used for pretty much any reptile. Um, the giant ones you just don't wanna use in leopard geckos and beardies and things like that if you're tossing them in immediately because they're gonna eat your culture. Most likely, I mean, leopard gecko is gonna go after a bug, you know, that's decent size, so. Uh, those are more for your, your, your bigger bearded dragons or your be bigger um, lizards and things like that. So it's just kind of more up to what you would like in your vivariums. You totally can put giant canyons in a leopard gecko vivarium. It would look really cool. Um, you'd see them a lot more. Um, but I stick with the small ones. Bioactive vivarium setups and why, why you would even spend all this time culturing or doing any of this. Uh, if you're a collector like me and you have as many reptiles as I do... Um, and you want to collect more, uh, cleaning is a hell of a task. And, you know, we're in quarantine right now, so I have all the time in the world because I'm a tattoo artist and I can't tattoo right now. But when I go back to work, I work five days a week, and then the other two days I'm, you know, either feeding snakes, um, cleaning 
enclosures or just catching up on a lot of things. I don't clean my bioactive setups. I don't touch them. I don't do. I, I, I water them, and that's it. Um, they are completely self-sustaining. Um, and another really, really, really cool thing. It is a great way to keep botanicals that are already reptile safe. Because you can take clippings from all your botanicals once they're um, cultured and set up. Um, you know, your, your bromeliads will actually grow clones of themselves so you can take them. Um, they're called pups. Um, you know, golden pothos you can clip. Like there's a lot of benefits to um, vivariums as well as you're bringing fresh air into your house. You know, you have, you have really nice plants. And the cool part is, is I usually try to pick a theme with every vivarium. Um, Jake was amazing and did these Amazonian type Aztec themes for the vivariums that I have. And we absolutely love them. They're from my gargoyle geckos. And for Smaug's tank, I did a Lord of the Rings style like Shire theme and it absolutely fell in love with it. And then for the two leopard geckos, we're kind of doing like whimsical forest themes. We were, we were thinking we were going to do more of like a, a stone structure, mountain structure, but it kind of just turned into the whimsical forest. Um, and I really like how they're turning out. Uh, it's really cool because um, the mixture I'm using for their substrate it stays really nicely dry in the layers that it needs to stay dry in, but it stays moist on the underneath layers, which is what the root systems need. So it's great for the succulents. Um, and I have all the tropicals in their own um, net pots. So they actually just get sprayed by themselves and they maintain their own moisture levels. Um, so yeah, it's just about being creative. Um, you know, making an entire enclosure is a completely different story. You know, actually building one is totally different. And um, my time lapse videos, I'll be showing you guys. You guys can, if you guys want me to do a voiceover one or go through a whole build video, we I'll uh, do a how to on on maybe a small ten gallon build or something. Um, it's just patience, checking yourself, making sure that all your seals are accurate, and. Uh, Number one thing for bioactive is you definitely want a tank that is not gonna allow anything to escape because these are isopods Like it's not gonna overwhelm your home, which is another thing why a lot of people don't want insects in their home um, These guys are found everywhere So if they do get out, they're just they're either gonna die in your house or they're gonna get out and go into the dirt and do their isopod thing um, springtails live everywhere so they'll literally just get out and you'll never even see or notice. Um, I've never, I haven't had any get out that I know of. Um, but yeah, so I, I keep dubias as well for my animals. So, I mean, I don't, I make sure that none of my insects get out. It's a really easy way of keeping a cleanup crew for yourself. And it's a really great way for self-sustaining, um, um, vivariums and for your reptiles. Uh, I'll go ahead and show you guys some of the vivariums behind me. I'll show you the one I just built. So this is Zoe's. Um, like I said, you just get really intricate with it. Um, pretty much all of that is, there's not too much substrate right here. There's just a little bit. All the substrate is pretty much at the bottom. And um, she has uh, super dwarf isopods, like the tiniest freaking isopods. I just snagged them today. Um, I'll put a video up on the screen, but they're in there and they're uh, they're doing good and she has I think Five armadillidian in there, so she'll get an armadillidian culture going um, But that's what hers will look like and Let's go over here so these are the three of the four three of the five um, tanks that Jake has built for um, my fiance and I but yeah, like I said, it's a great way to keep botanicals. You get a whole bunch of different types of um, plants. I mean, like I could literally just clip some of this off and put it into another enclosure. Um, I actually am going to be clipping some of the golden pothos that's growing um, and throwing it into another enclosure. Um, and it won't even, it'll grow back super quick and it'll be perfect. Um, same thing with some of the plants over here, like these bromeliads. Um, once the Crimpanthus pink star and the one in the back grows a second shoot, I'm going to go ahead and take one of the pups from there and actually start rooting them in some other ones. Um, same thing with the, I forget what these are, the philodendrons, I think. I'm not quite sure. But yeah, you can keep botanicals that way. Um, you can do lots of different styles of vivariums. We tried our, our hand at an open face vivarium, which normally isn't what you do because you need the humidity locked in, but so far it's been flourishing. Um, you just have to be diligent about 
um, uh, misting this one. But then he did this micro one for us, and I mean, it's just super cool. Like, he opened our world to a whole new different plants. Like, there's these plants that have pink underneath the leaves that are just absolutely beautiful. And uh, all of our animals love it. And this is the enclosure I built for Smaug. So, like I said, it's a cool way to keep botanicals because you can, I can literally take clippings of anything in here that you guys see and these will all grow pups and I can take all those bromeliads and use them throughout my house, use them throughout other reptile enclosures. Um, I can sell them to you guys. Like it's a lot of fun um, keeping these things at your house um, and what bioactive can open your whole world up to um, because bioactive is specifically mainly for keeping plants and having a cleanup crew for your animal. Um, and if you guys don't even have reptiles but you like the look of these things, build yourself a vivarium. You still need a cleanup crew for the soil and everything like that, so get some dwarf whites or something and uh, get some smaller isopods. And all they eat is leaf litter. All you have to do every every few months if you're going to have uh, uh, a vivarium like that, every like six months or so, you see that leaf litter, you would just want to top off some sphagnum moss or ABG mix and just go ahead and throw some ABG mix on the top of that so that your soil, that you know, you're adding to it every, every six days. Other than that, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, um, feel free to drop them down below in the comment section. Let me know what you guys think. I, I really like these videos. I hope this is helpful for everyone that was wondering what bioactive is, what isopods are, um, how you take care of them, because it's super duper 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 easy. Um, like I said, it's just an ABG mix. Um, I'll go ahead and put the parts up right here. Um, and that's their food, their living space, everything. And I throw a magnolia leaf litter on top, whole leaves so they can hide under. And then, like I said, I purchased the Rapashi morning wood. Um, it's really not that expensive and it goes a long way and they love it. It helps get the humidity up in it because um, it turns to this like gel and holds moisture. Um, but also they smell it and they love it. They go right to it. So if you guys have any questions, drop them down below. Other, other than that, be sure to like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe for more. Thank you guys. All right. Peace.